Good evening, everyone. I'm Rita Kakis, and I want to thank you for spending your evening with us. We hope that you and your families are staying healthy and safe. We welcome back our faithful followers and are thrilled to see some new faces. So I'll just quickly provide a bit of background and context to our event. Um, our annual event, Historia DC, is taken from the Filipino word, which means story. For the past five years, we've shared the stories of Washington DC Filipinos at our annual October event, which is Filipino American History Month, and it's also Archives Month. But beginning in May this year, due to the coronavirus pandemic, Historia DC became a monthly online series. Slide two, please. Our speaker this evening is Nila Terribio Straka. Um, Nila's family and my family have known each other for many, many, many years. Our fathers knew each other after serving in World War II, and our mothers were very close friends, raising their families in the P Prince George's County areas. Nila was everyone's big sister, and as the neighborhood piano teacher, I was one of her students at age six, but I didn't continue on. Little did we both know that more than 60 years later, we would become partners in uncovering and sharing many important histories about our parents and about the Washington DC Filipino community. Around 1993, I took on a photo documentary project to interview Filipinos who settled here in the Washington DC area in the early decades of the 20th century. Many of the men described a community center called the Manila House near Washington Circle that was a community gathering place for Filipinos from the 1930s to the 1950s. But nobody had any specifics or any evidence that the place existed. Could we have slide three, please, Tichi? In 2008, when I was writing Filipinos in Washington, DC, imagine my glee when Nila mentioned that her grandmother cooked meals at the Manila house and they had pictures. Neela's mother, Ampering, had a treasure trove of scrapbooks and photo albums, revealing a well-preserved color photograph of the woman whom everyone knew as Manong, which translates to older sister in the Filipino language. Ampering had several photos of events marked as taking place in the Manila house. Eureka, this became our first evidence of the Manila house. Slide four, please. And in this picture, here are Neela's parents. Um, over the next decade, we uncovered more evidence and community stories, such as the 1937 deed for the Manila House, which was purchased by the Visayan Circle. We found many, many Washington Post articles, and we have the writings by the well-known Filipino writer, Bienvenido Santos, when he lived at the Manila House in the 1940s. Next slide, please. An even bigger, bigger surprise happened in 2015 when another family friend, Maria Chapman, presented her mother's photo album that included three tiny photos. Here are Maria's parents with their two friends standing in front of a building. And if we can go to the next slide. If you take a look at the uh, transom of the door, it clearly reads Manila House 2422 which is the house number on K Street that's on the transom. Next slide, please. By that time, we had enough evidence of the existence of the Manila House community building. And in 2016, we applied for and received a bronze plaque commemorating the former Manila House. Next slide, please. In honor of that wonderful portrait of Manong from Ampering's photo albums, the Trivio family co-sponsored the acquisition of this important landmark, which was installed at 2422 K Street, which is currently owned by St. Paul's Episcopal Church. And here's Neela holding up the plaque before it was installed. You can see that the, um, the building still looks very similar and it's in the same spot. You could read more about the Manila House on our website, or you could leave a question for us in the chat. We're grateful for Neela's mother's wonderful photo albums, which helped us share the story of a significant Washington, D.C. community. Now, to the next slide, 
You'll learn about another one of Ampering's fascinating albums as presented by her daughter, Neela Toribia Straco. I'm honored to introduce Neela, who, like me, is a native Washingtonian and lives with her husband, Joe, on Cobb Island in Maryland. Neela holds a master's degree in physical education from the University of Colorado and was head volleyball coach at Georgetown University. Neela is currently the associate head coach at the College of Southern Maryland and co-director of the Southern Maryland Volleyball Club. A 14-year breast cancer survivor, Neela has been affiliated with breast cancer research and education programs for many years. Neela is also vice president of my foundation for preserving Filipino history here in Washington, DC. Before we begin, please bear with me for another 30 seconds. The event will be recorded. We will mute your audio. Feel free to turn off your video if you don't want to be seen. Questions will be answered at the end of Neela's talk. You can post your questions ahead of time in the chat box located at the bottom of the screen. Thank you again for your attention. Now let's meet Neela. I think I'm unmuted now. Hello and good evening. Um, I wanted to say thank you. It's an honor and it's exciting for me to share our mother's story as a Filipino cadet corps nurse from Washington DC region as she traveled to Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in 1947. Um, this next slide will show the scrapbook that mom um, put together during her uh, adventures and it prompted me to put together this presentation that, will, um, that I will be giving you. But let me give you a little bit of brief history of our mother. Next slide. My mom was born Dorrance Eleanor Relucio on August 29, 1926 uh, at Casualty Hospital in Washington, DC, and was baptized at St. Peter's Church on Capitol Hill. That hospital later became known as the Columbia Hospital for Women, and my siblings and I were all born at the same hospital that our mother was born in. I was also baptized at the same church. Her parents then separated when she turned three, and my mom and her two siblings were then put into foster care, and later she was sold for $500 and adopted by a Filipino family that um, was our grandparents, and then renamed her Ampering Santos Godiel. They relocated to Annapolis, Maryland, where she attended elementary school and middle school. And then the family moved to Portsmouth, Virginia, where she attended Wilson High School. This next slide will show you um, a yearbook that I found of hers um, that shows her ambition started early and young to become a nurse. This is my mom down here. You see the arrow pointing to her and her little saying up there. Um, before we continue on the next slide, I'd like to give you guys a kind of a brief history of the Cadet Corps nurses. And Chi Chi, could you hit the next slide, please? The Cadet Corps nurses was a organization that was established by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1943 because of the lack of um, nurses here in the United States. Many of them were in the military service and then serving time uh, in World War II. About 80% of the nurses care in our hospitals at that time were performed by the cadet nurses. Next slide. There are many opportunities for these women and my mom and her friends took advantage of them. Um, it wasn't simply just a job uh, for nursing, but it kind of was the impetus for a career on a long-term potential. Many of the women uh, could join from ages 17 to 35. They were not discriminated upon. Uh, he made sure, the president made sure at that time, to make sure that there was no discrimination based on race, creed, or religion. They received assistance for their nursing program, and there were four areas of study that they um, were involved in, medicine, surgery, 
pediatrics or obstetrics. And the nurses were also guaranteed once they graduated college that they could then take their boards. I felt that the most important thing about this whole thing was setting a standard for the education of our nurses today. Next slide. There were many benefits that uh, they received. $1,300 approximately was allowed for a nurse to receive a three-year education. 80% of that went to housing, um, their uniforms, and then about 18% went to tuition and fees. This is kind of the reverse of what a college student has to go through today. Approximately 169,000 students were in the program, but only about 124,000 actually completed their cadet corps training, and 83% were from that group. After graduation and receiving their um, nursing degree, those nurses back then made approximately 5000 to um, 5000 to $7,500. The average wage of a registered nurse today is about $77,000, and the average hourly wage is about 37 bucks. Next slide. This is a contract that my mom received um, for her to take on the responsibilities of getting out to, um, oh, is it South Dakota? and becoming a um, senior cadet corps nurse out there. She received a stipend of about 720 bucks for an appointment that was not to be limited to more than six months. Next slide. Her travel expenses, I thought this was interesting. This shows a $9 reimbursement. And then on the back, which is our next slide, the um, Stipend for that $9 was broken up into the following. They left on a Friday out of Baltimore on a train around 515 and received $4 for that day to eat, um, $3, $2 for that day. Then the next day was a full day. And then the next day on the third day, they received three bucks because they came into um, the Pine Ridge area at around 2.15 in the afternoon. So a total of $9 to get out there. Their total trip uh, for the train was about 68 bucks. And they also, it looks like they spent $13 to get a sleeper coach for their three days of travel. Next slide. This is a map showing where um, mom took off by train. And the other interesting thing, throughout her scrapbook, um, she had at least 25 postcards uh, of every time that she went somewhere. And this helped me to trace exactly her steps. So they went from Baltimore to New York City, stopped in Chicago, and then into Riceville, Nebraska, and then by car to um, Pine Ridge. Joe and I, on our trip, we really didn't have a game plan as to what we were doing, but in um, that summer of 2019, we decided that, hey, why don't we see about um, this scrapbook and see if we can find some of the buildings that um, we were going to see in, in Pine Ridge. So as we traveled out there, our first destination was um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, where our kids live. And then from there, we went on to, um, through uh, Iowa, and then back into Nebraska, through Nebraska, and up to Pine Ridge. Next slide. This is some of the um, landscape that we got to see coming into the Oglala um, Lakota Indian Reservation. And as we were traveling, like I mentioned before, we really didn't have a game plan. Um, but Joe had suggested maybe we should try to contact somebody out there. So our first call was to the Chamber of Commerce, and they had suggested us to get in touch with um, this college called Oglala Lakota College that had an archivist on site. So what are the chances of that happening that we would find somebody like that? Um, so as we traveled, 
we then got to meet um, these women. In the next slide, please. They, um, I got in touch with Tawa Dashino, who was their main archivist, and she was very receptive to meeting us. And so we went to the library that houses the archives. She also mentioned there was a genealogist, and her name was Stella uh, Ironcloud that uh, was going to meet us as well. And as we drove to the library, I wasn't sure what I was going to, what to find with them, what we were going to share. But the next uh, couple of days, I didn't realize our new home or away from home was going to be spent with Stella Tawa and Ellen White Thunder telling stories and digitizing our mother's scrapbook. Next slide. As we started, oh, actually, uh, could you back up one slide? If you see here, um, we had mom's scrapbook all on this table and just kind of going through it real quickly. And Stella is the lady in the red, uh, came across, and you can hit the next slide now. She came across this school bulletin called the Aglala Light. And in there, she found several of her um, relatives that um, she... Oh, you want this? Yeah, go ahead. This, this whole thing of Stella seeing some of the people that mm -hmm. you know, solicited our trip and our visit. <laughs> it was pretty exciting for us to hear that. Yeah. Next slide. Next slide. Mm -hmm. This scrapbook. Stella found uh, these pictures of Pine Ridge Hospital and yeah. told this that we were on our, they were on their third hospital actually. Ironically, Stella is a retired RN and had worked in the second hospital. So where the tree is in the picture to the left of that was the first original hospital. This is the second hospital and um, the one on the bottom is a third one um, that is called the, let's see if I can remember the name, the Indian Health Center. And Joe and I actually got to walk in the hallways there. And it was exciting because it gave me a sense of like what my mom might have walked through if she, she was in the, that uh, hospital there. Next slide. She didn't have a lot of pictures of any of the uniforms or in the hospital itself, but these were two that I found. One at the bottom there was the operating room. Unfortunately, it's a little bit out of focus. And the other one is uh, one of her friends in a nursing uniform. Heading back to the scrapbook on our next slide, um, mom saved everything and um, from postcards to pictures to rules and regulations of what was to be expected of the cadet corps nurses. And this was taken on her first day of their arrival to Pine Ridge. These pictures show the beginning of the Sioux Sundance celebration that lasted about three to four days. And the Sundance celebration usually involves a um, community gathering together to pray for healing. And some individuals actually make personal sacrifices on behalf of their community. The Indians, as you see in these pictures, are in full regala dress. And I think, if, I don't know if you can see the inscription there or her writing, she mentions that as they came into the town, they heard the beating of drums and again, just to imagine coming off of a train and driving into the city, and this is the first thing that you encounter on the Indian Reservation. Next slide. <clears throat> this is a couple of more shots that she had of these teepees. Normally during these celebrations, they will um, erect four to six teepees uh, for the participants that will be doing the dancing. All right, so on the next slide, you'll see the um, employee hotel. And I did a comparison picture. This, the top point, of course, in black and white is mom's photo. And this was our photo as we drove through. But this government building hotel was for congressmen and people from the uh, Department of Interior 
that would come into Pine Ridge for periodic inspections of the reservation. It was also the first place that mom and the other nurses from Baltimore would stay until they had finished their um, processing of their arrival. Next slide. This is a copy um, of her uh, cadet handbook. And it stated all the rules and regulations that they would have to follow. It's about four or five pages. But interesting thing that I found there was the um, thing about church services and recreation activities that they could take advantage of. And it was very evident throughout mom's scrapbook that the church was a major influence in the community, both religiously and um, socially. Um, and it was evident in our visit as well. The local high school was the main building in the community that was also utilized. Next, please. The equipment list that she had to sign off on was each uh, nurse was given their own room and they had to sign off on a bed, mattress, pillow, that kind of thing. The uniforms that they received, um, they were given four white uniforms, two blue ones, a striped one, and uh, four aprons. Um, next slide. And that's a little bit of that. They had laundry every Thursday that they were allowed to do their uniforms only. And there's a part in here at the bottom that uh, talks about the nurses having to be on a night shift. And those night duties, I thought, was interesting. They were told to be in bed from 9 to 4, and on the day that they had to work, they were allowed to get up at 2 o'clock. I have a niece, Ashley, that's studying to be a nurse, and my future daughter-in-law, Virginia, also is an RN right now at Inova Fairfax in Virginia. Both of them work these kind of shifts, but the shifts that they work today are 12 hour shifts from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. or 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. So it was interesting to see that they still had those um, type of things back in 1947. Next slide. <clears throat> this is the phone directory that she saved and Stella again found several of her relatives listed in the directory and mom even wrote in there that this is a nurse's college, this is us. Next. This is a nursing home that, they called it the nurse's home or cottage. Uh, it's no longer in existence today, but it looks similar to a college dorm if you were to go um, on campus somewhere. Um, in the bottom left-hand picture, mom points to her room there on the left-hand top side. And then this was the view from her room looking out into Pine Ridge. Next. So throughout her um, working there at the hospital, I came across this letter from a uh, patient and it was from an Indian mother that um, mom took care of in the OB ward. So it, it again, it justified showing the training that she would get as in part of working with these people and the appreciation that the uh, Indians had for the nurses that were there at Pine Ridge. Next slide. Um, extracurricular activities were a big uh, event for the nurses and um, I'm calling them extracurricular activities. They're, they were listed in that guide um, for rule book as a, uh, as a recreation, but there were movies every Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday at the school auditorium. Then transportation was provided for them to go hiking, fishing, skating, and various other activities. The activities at Pine Ridge were normally organized by the Native Americans, by the church, and the local hospital. Next. This one here is um, a ceremony uh, that the mom got to attend. The photo shows um, the Sioux and the Lakota Indians in their native dress, again. Um, they considered themselves the westernmost dialect, and the focus back in the 1870s 
was that they were a defiant, resisting uh, colonization and assimilation on the Great Plains. Some of you might remember from your own history, um, some of the Lakota leaders as Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, Red Bull, um, that were all from this reservation. In the top right-hand corner of this uh, photo, Tawa and Stella identified this as a tribal council meeting, and they had mentioned they had never seen a tribal photo meeting before. Um, the next photo, you'll see uh, again some native dress, and the top right-hand corner, this is um, the in the library itself. They have two glass cases here that house the female dress, which is on the left, and the male uh, dress on the right. And you can see how the ones that mom took are not as ornate as the one up top. If you look at the male uh, casing in the top picture and compare that to the uh, Indian, the Native American below, the V-shaped um, of the neck is very similar with that. I thought that was kind of interesting. All right, next slide. <clears throat> this was um, mom and her friends in native dress. I uh, didn't mention that she also traveled with two other um, nursing friends of hers from Mercy Hospital. The one on the top right is Pat Allen, and the one on the bottom left is Ann Cook, who was also my godmother. Um, there were the other nurses that you see in that top left-hand left -hand picture, they're from uh, New York and Pennsylvania. So there were a total of five cadet nurses that went out to Pine Ridge. Um, so Stella and Tawa had made mention that they were not aware that non-Americans could dress in full ceremonial um, dress as you see here in mom's photos. So the next photo, you'll see them uh, circled here a little bit with, uh, where they're sitting. Next photo, please. Um, so they had also mentioned the beading that these ladies are wearing was very um, important at that time. So I have to assume that um, these women made an impression enough that they were included in the um, Native American ceremonies. Next, please. This is a uh, hymns in the Sioux in their native language and tongue that mom saved. And then the following slides will be um, of these extracurricular activities that they got to do. Um, this one is a picture of the rodeos. Next, please. This one is a hunting trip that they got to take and go on. And I was telling my sister today, I don't ever remember our mother ever holding a gun in her hand or going hunting. Um, I know myself, my brothers uh, have all gone hunting, but I, I never pictured my mom doing that. Next one. This is just some random shots that you can see. Um, they had fun out there at that time. It's uh, the majority of her scrapbook, like I was saying, uh, displays a lot of the, the good times that they had out there. Next. This is winter in Pine Ridge. And if you've ever been out in that country, um, the range is very flat. So the snows can pile up very high. The temperatures can be very extreme and get to be 50 below. And the winters can be very hot, 110 degrees. Um, this just shows them where my mom's in the top left picture. She's in thigh high snow. So in the next slide, you'll see them uh, going ice skating. And there's a writing here of mom saying that um, she fell in, she and another nurse fell into the water. So again, this is another activity I've never seen my mom do is ice skate. And I can't imagine that she would after falling in. But uh, that bottom picture is um, the hospital and the nurse's home is in the background. Next. 
They went to dances at the church and the high school. This was a flyer. Uh, the cost for the girls to get in was 25 cents. The guys was 50 cents. And then mom even writes here, um, we even needed a chaperone. It felt that it was really a square side. And, uh, you know, again, showing the difference of, of how we are today. Because when kids go to dances, they just go. Next. <clears throat> this is, um, as I mentioned, the churches were the focal point of activity and supported people on the reservation. In 1876, Chief Red Cloud demanded that the, he called them the black robes be allowed to assist his people. And that vision is incorporated today. That um, original church, um, next slide please. This original church here on the left was built with um, trees from, the near, from nearby and they use red bricks. And according to the research that I did, this was one of the very first churches east of the Missouri River to use uh, bricks. Unfortunately, in um, 1996, the church burnt down on Easter, I think it was Good Friday, and then it was resurrected again in the colored picture you see that I took there. Next, please. This is the inside of the church. Um, mom's picture and this is the inside of the church when we visited. Next. A high school in Pine Ridge um, takes on a different look as you can see that in the bottom picture. The um, picture on the right, top right, is a picture of the girls boarding school and Jill and I went to an Indian museum this past fall up in Michigan, and their display there was about the um, boarding schools that the Indians were forced to uh, attend to be indoctrinated in the so-called white man's ways. Um, so I didn't have a chance to ask Stella or Tawa if that were the case here. And the premise of that was to separate the kids from the parents so that they could learn and not uh, learn more about the white man, but not have all the traditions that the Indians wanted to preserve. Next. This here is the uh, inside again of the Holy Rosary Mission High School. We were um, fortunate that on our first day there, Tawa's daughter was graduating high school and Tawa graciously um, invited us to attend uh, high school graduation, which Joe and I totally accepted. Um, I'd never been to an Indian graduation. Um, so here we are in the church that um, they also had about um, 25 graduates and none of them wore caps and gowns like we do traditionally in our high school graduation. But the other really cool thing was is that they maintained their Indian traditions and heritage. The uh, girls wore a plume off the side of their hair and the guys wore a feather. Um, the graduation was also part of the mass. So again, showing the church being involved with a lot of activities. The drums that you see there on the bottom, at the end of the ceremony, several of the students went over and uh, began chanting and hitting the drums, um, again, keeping their tradition of their tribe alive. And then after graduations, what I thought was really cool, the whole parish, all the parents, normally what we do is go to your parent and then you take your pictures and you leave. At the end of this graduation ceremony, they all lined up outside of the church, like a wedding reception, and the graduates followed through shook the hands of everybody in the community. And to me, I thought that was really special to show um, the rite of passage of graduation from high school and starting a new life as a student. I thought it was, it was really cool. Next, please. <clears throat> we start to get into the winter months um, where Christmas on the reservation I must have four or five pages of Christmas cards, tags, um, 
of and also telegrams that mom received. And one of her quotes here, she says, this Christmas has been the happiest Christmas I've ever spent away from home. I spent one Christmas away from my family in the Philippines once, my, my sister and I were there. And I'll tell you, it was a little rough. So for these women to be away from home and being in a different culture, um, it's exciting to see that they were having a great time. Next. This is a road trip that they took. Um, the closest town to this Pine Ridge is about 125, 135 miles away. And this is a, a winter trip that they took to get there to go Christmas shopping. Next. This is just showing you some of the decorations that uh, we all do here in our homes, the gathering of the children at the church, the meal that they had um, at that time. Next, please. This slide here was from the parish priest, and I have um, this arrow pointing to this mention of the government hospital, um, and again showing that the influence of the Catholic Church to help raise funds to keep the hospital going. Uh, this is what um, he was asking for here. Um, again, in talking with Stella and Tawa, the church was a major influence of the people on the reservation, not only back then, but today as well. Next. <clears throat> so after our three days of scanning and digitizing moms, um, these pictures and everything, Joe and I did uh, a drive-by through Pine Ridge. These are our pictures. The town is very small, has one main intersection with a light, as you see there in the picture. You go two blocks to the right, two left, two in front, two behind, you are out of Pine Ridge. So it's a very, very small town. Um, there aren't any banks, motels, uh, dollar stores, there's one grocery store that, that's a moderate size. And um, as we were getting gas, this Conoco was probably the hoppinest place in all of Pine Ridge, uh, where people were buying beer and, and getting odds and ends that they needed. The um, population in the town right now is about 20,000. Uh, I, I couldn't find statistics on how many people lived in Pine Ridge. But as you looked, as I showed you these pictures of moms, um, pictures of Pine Ridge, you'll, you'll see that uh, it's very similar of what you see here in our pictures. Next. <clears throat> this is the Sacred Heart Church, was also a main focus in Pine Ridge. Um, it is still there today, as you can see in my photo, and that's the photo that mom had. This is the post office. This, and this was the only standing building they, we could find that, that had the same um, roof structure as the post office in mom's photo, which I thought was kind of cool. Next. These next couple of slides will be just of the Pine Ridge area. There's a picture of the bakery, um, picture of like the pool hall and some of the other areas that were there. As I mentioned, there are 20,000 so, uh, people on the reservation as of the 2014-2018 uh, census. Approximately uh, 9,600 are men and 10,000 are women. The majority, uh, 16,000 of them are Native Americans. Next. Again, just some more parting slides um, of the street you can see. Next slide. You can see the buildings were very small. Um, and they, as like I said, uh, two, two streets in, two streets out, that's it. Next slide. Next one. This here is a, um, this is how mom scrapbook was. She saved everything. This are basketball tickets. This is a fundraiser for the uh, hospital. Um, she saved match covers, and you'll see some other things as we go on here. Next slide. 
This is her journey to um, taking a trip to the hot springs, uh, South Hot Springs in South Dakota. Next slide. This is Evans Springs or Evans Plunge. And uh, the brochure that you see on the left is what it looked like in the cars of um, yesteryear. Joe and I went to there and the blue building there is what it looks like today. And the inside, if you know, this is very similar to that um, photo on the brochure. This is a hot springs that has been utilized by the Lakota Indians as a healing waters. And it's still being used that way today. Um, the cost of admission for mom back then was 25 cents. Our cost of admission was 12 bucks. So things have changed a little bit. Next slide. This is some more of Hot Springs and the main drag and pictures um, that I, we tried to replicate like from the brochures. And at night, Joe and I went to the only restaurant that was open uh, was a Chinese restaurant. Our bill came to about 20 bucks. And in the next slide, you'll see mom had a dinner here, a pork sandwich or something for like a, a dollar ten. Next, please. <clears throat> um, we then went into um, Mount Rushmore. And even here, you can see mom saved a piece of bark from one of the trees. These are some vintage postcards that she has several packs of these in her scrapbook. Next. <clears throat> Some more shots from Mount Rushmore. This is colored one is from Joe and I um, of that. I don't know where these buildings are uh, as we did not see those when we were traveling there. Next. Um, so again, trying to replicate where mom was. That's her on the top right. That's me. I'm holding a picture of her. Unfortunately, our day when we went there was kind of overcast. Uh, so we didn't. Uh, I didn't get the, the presidents in the background, but um, these are some views of that. Next one. So as we traveled around, Joe and I um, ran across this picture and it kind of looks like the same place that mom and them were climbing around. Um, we got to spend the night at the um, campgrounds there. We got up at uh, before dawn and got to watch the sunrise on at the Badlands, which was just totally awesome. Next, please. Some more shots. Um, a lot of the roads were not paved. And um, this one of Joe and I here is at the Painted Rocks. And the one right below it is the same one mom shot. And we're almost in the same spot. Taking that picture, we didn't know that. But there you see again, um, the the top right left hand corner with the uh, dirt roads, the bottom corner with the herd of uh, buffalo. And in our next slide, you'll see um, one buffalo. And that was about it that we got to see in the wild. But this is how beautiful that country is. Uh, we were blessed to see a double rainbow one day as well. Next, please. So this is the parting shot of um, in mom's scrapbook. And I want to read to you um, this. If you can't see it, I'm not sure if you can or not. But it says, how wonderful and kind these people have been to us. The peace and the serenity of Pine Ridge will never be forgotten by us. We were fortunate enough to be spent or be sent by the government on affiliation with our last six months of our cadet corps. Here in Pine Ridge, we learned to serve those Sioux Indians who were desperately in need of medical and moral guidance, as well as understanding from all of us. We have gained grace by serving our church, the priest, and the missionaries here at Pine Ridge. So I thought that was um, very, very poignant, Anne, and I love that picture uh, that she took. Next slide. So they went back to um, Mercy Hospital. This was a letter that they got from their, um, the priest that they uh, did a lot with, Father um, Fuller. And that little arrow was pointing to a thing that says, he makes reference to the new group at the hospital. It's not the same anymore. They're a good bunch, but not the same old spirit. 
we hope to get a couple of new Catholic cadets before the time is up at, that we can work here. So the cadet program, unfortunately, was dropped by the United States government in 1948. And to this day, the nurses who served in the cadet program are trying to get recognition as nurses that were part of an active military uh, group, not really part of the military, but were helping to serve that, those people um, in World War II and uh, as a nurse. Um, there's programs now that they are trying to advocate to get recognition for these cadet corps nurses. Um, they never received any military benefits or anything, but they did serve their country. Next slide. <clears throat> um, upon return to uh, the class, their class, this is called the class of 1947. I called... Um, got in touch with uh, Mercy Hospital and talked to a gentleman, uh, got in touch with him and said, do you have any information about the Cadet Corps program at Mercy? And he said, I'm sorry, but I don't even think we had that here. So I sent him this documentation, sent him the um, Department of Interior letter that my mom had signed for contract, and then he did a little bit more uh, digging. Um, He's the hospital's unofficial historian, said he wasn't, like, he wasn't aware, but then he found this about my mom in 1947. Those are the three girls that went, and then the next slide shows their nursing picture was in February of 1948. So we kind of put this together that these girls were out there from the summer of 47, came back to Baltimore in 48, and then that would bridge the gap of why they weren't on campus at that time. So um, following this uh, presentation, I'm hoping to help them to upgrade their um, library so that recognition for these nurses again can take place as contributing to um, our society. Next slide. Another thing that I did, I uh, got in touch with the Filipino Association of uh, Metropolitan DC, and they are an organization of Filimer Fili Filipino American nurses in DC, and also a local uh, and part of a national chapter called the Filipino National Nurses Association of America. The current president, Lourdes Herrera, said she wasn't aware of any Filipino members that might have served in World War II, but there was a woman on the advisory council that did uh, do army military service as a Filipino nurse in the uh, Vietnam War. I also asked her if she knew how many nurses, Filipino nurses, were in the Washington, D.C. area, and there are approximately 43,500 nurses and there are a total of 129,000 nurses. So we almost make up half of that population. Next slide. The um, women here that you see, I also interviewed uh, these women that are um, part of the retired Filipino nurses of the Navy Corps. Since the... Um, group of the cadet corps was dropped the the united states government still has and and has since 1908 that's when this uh, navy corps was founded um, all branches of service have a nursing program and these women here are in the well, i call them the pioneer group of the navy corps of nurses um, they were some of the very few uh, women who were Filipino that got to be um, joined as a commission officer, and then they were required to do um, officer development school. They became leaders in their field, and they uh, eventually became um, the leadership and took leadership roles for the Filipino nurses of that um, time. Next slide. So as we talk about 
Filipino nurses, my mom in the cadet corps, the other branches of military service. Um, it's not just about Filipinos, it's about nursing, but it's exciting that Filipino nurse, Filipinos have, um, Filipinas have been given the opportunity to be a nurse. Our Filipino nurses today are faced with many challenges in their present situation with the pandemic. And many are forced to make choices between their own health and their patient's health. Filipinos are a very compassionate um, nurse uh, about their duties, and they are sometimes asked to do more with less resources. During the pandemic, there have been approximately 2,000 nurses that have died of COVID. 31.5% of them have been Filipinos. I asked these um, retired nurses if they would share uh, their thoughts of what they could tell Filipino nurses of today. And Jeannie offered this advice. She said, nurses need to be open to opportunity, to open life, uh, to be open to life and learning, find a role model, a mentor or a coach, be an advocate for yourself and your patient. By taking care of yourself personally and professionally, we can do better to serve our patients, each of us and the next generation. And I think that's an important message that um, we need to say to everyone these days and to thank our, our nurses that are out on the uh, front lines. The next slide, I'd like to part with this. We always call nurses heroes, but I want to call them warriors. And um, I feel that every nurse is drawn into this profession because they care, they serve, and they help. My mom was a hero an adventurer, and a warrior. So I'd like to leave you with these words of, um, that I found that were from City Bull. Warriors are not what you think they are as warriors. A warrior is not someone who fights because no one has the right to take another life. A warrior for us is the one who sacrifices himself for the good of others. His task is to take care of the elderly, the defensive, those who do not and cannot provide for themselves and above all the children and the future of humanity. So this was a quote from Sitting Bull, and I thought it was poignant and tied into our whole presentation here tonight. So on behalf of the myself, my family, my mom, um, thank you all for being here and sharing her story as a cadet for a nurse. Great, thank you, Neela, that was fantastic. Um, there are a couple of comments in the chat room if anybody wants to read um, about more about the US Cadet Corps, Nurse Corps. Um, does anybody have any questions for Neela? There were none in the chat early on. Um, um, can you hear me, Neela? Uh-huh. Neela, can you hear yes. How old was, I may have missed this, how old was your mom when she started this program? So when she went, out, when she went out there to South Dakota, she was 23. So okay. she, and well, two years prior to that, so 21. That was a three year program. Okay, that was one of my questions. And um, I took notes. Um, how many, uh, the hospitals that you showed, the three different hospitals. Uh -huh. How many beds, if, if you know this, how many beds were in the hospital when your mom was at the, uh, was it Pine Ridge? Do you, do you know that? No, I don't, I'm sorry. And I didn't ask Stella. Um, the only other thing that I do know about the hospital today is that they're, um, they do nursing surgery a little bit, but there are only two resident nurses, uh, doctors there on site. So right, right. I, they treat the local population. Correct. Right. Okay. Oh, and the, you're talking about your mom came from Mercy Hospital in Baltimore. Yes, correct. That yeah. was there when I was in nursing school at the University of Maryland. Mercy Hospital was one of the places. So, correct. So that's great. 
you know, Rita mentioned I'm a breast cancer survivor. So as I did my surgery, I uh, had my um, surgery at uh, Mercy Hospital, and it kind of yeah. came full circle for me to say, wow, my mom even was here, you know, so there was a reason for me being in the hospital as well. It meant a little bit more. Hila, okay. Mel has one question. Well, I oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Oh, um, was church attendance I mandatory or voluntary at Pine Ridge? Say that again. Was church attendance mandatory or voluntary at Pine Ridge? I have to assume it's voluntary, but I also have to assume that um, the Jesuits were the main focus on top of the Department of Interior, why the nursing uh, cadets were out there. Um, Mercy Hospital is a Catholic hospital. I'm sure the two, you know, went hand in hand. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it might have been mandatory. I'm not sure. I like to say no, because we need to have choices in life about religion. But I'm sure back then it was <laughs> an obligation or something to do. It was the 1940s after all. Yes. I have a question for you, Neela. Um, were you able to talk with your mom about the album? Yeah, so um, we, all the pictures that we have, and we, like Rita said, we have bins of pictures and stacks of uh, photo albums. We have gone through that at one time together, but, um, you know, just, I guess I was only in high school or maybe in college, and you know back then you're not really focused on, oh my God, this is, you know, all these little minute details. Um, the thing that I regret is not being able to ask her some of these questions and get some answers to it. But yes, we did share it. Right. Are there any questions that you um, want to ask her today? Um, after looking through this album and then, you know, talking with the archivists, are there things that, questions that you have that you wish that you'd ask her? Well, you know, just just some of the things like how how did you feel being out there with Native Americans and that culture? Obviously, they had a great time because that whole album is, as the pictures I presented, um, it looked like they were playing more than they were working. <laughs> but, you know, just to see how that, that was, and even like walking that first day onto a um, town, we are hearing beating of the drums. You're seeing maybe hundreds, I'm assuming, of Native Americans in, in war dress and uh, doing a ceremony is, um, it's pretty exciting, but it can also be scary, you know. Yeah. And another question I had was, what did they feel the facility was like? You know, you see that picture of that operating room, that's bare bones. I mean, it didn't even look like um, something I wanted to be in. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yes. Um, what was the uh, reservation like? You know, I think of reservations as having a lot of poverty and social problems. It right. doesn't sound like that reservation is having that. Or what did you notice? Well, as we go through, if you've ever been at um, in South Dakota, from one end of the reservation to the other is almost a hundred miles, you know, so you're going from one section to the other. Very uh, open range. We really didn't see, I've been on other Indian reservations and it is very impoverished with, you know, trailers and torn down things. I really didn't see that. I saw some nice homes. I saw some trailers that were you know, cleaned up and, and fixed up compared to what I've seen before. Um, the college was, you know, state of the art. It, it's similar to the college that I work at. And uh, it, I thought it was fine. The town itself, that Pine Ridge town, um, did not have a lot to offer other than what I showed you in those pictures. So um, that's sort of the main part, but there are small little branch, small towns. The college itself was in this town called Kyle, and the only thing there is the college. Across the street is a restaurant, and that's it. 
And um, it, was, it was interesting, Joe and I had lunch there. And in that RV picture, you saw our RV. We sat down and all of a sudden this table next to us goes, oh, hey, hi, you're the guys from Maryland. You know, just like that. I mean, <laughs> you couldn't miss us because we would go up and down the roads, but um, you know, it's, it's a small place. It's not real big. Huh? Neela, um, assuming this was a three-year um, program for your mother, but um, you said that she went out when she was 21 years old. Right. Well, yeah. she started nursing school at 21, 21 or 20, and then she was out there in 47, she would have been 23. Okay, yeah. yeah. I don't know if she didn't go right away to nursing school after high school or not. I never asked her that either. But for her to be 21 years old back then, that was, right. a bold, that was a bold move for a woman back then. Totally, yeah. And I think that the thing that helped with that is having two other friends along the way with them. Um, my mom's always been adventurous and, all, and always has encouraged us to do that as well. Um, it's very bold. And if I relate that to the Filipino nurses coming from Manila, and coming to the States or any other country, that's a bold move as well. And um, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of guts to, to go to a different country and a different culture and give up your family for a while. Yeah. Sure it does, yeah. Okay, um, we've reached the end of our program. Um, I wanted to thank Neela so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, I just love, your mom's photographs and having seen her other albums, um, she had this wonderful sense of documenting her environment and her daily activities. Like I love that portrait of the, um, the mother and her child. Uh, it's, it's just, it's like watching, looking through somebody's Instagram feeds. I don't do Instagram, but you know, <laughs> I, I imagine that's probably what, you know, keeping these kind of uh, scrapbooks must have been like. Yeah. Um, so, so before we get off, I just want to thank um, Tawa, I believe is on, on tonight, and Ellen uh, from the reservation, Stella's on, all the nurses that are out there. I have several of my friends that aren't Filipino nurses and are on, Judy, your one, Pam, your sister, and um, anyone else that might be in the medical field. Um, my, like I said, my future daughter-in-law, Virginia, they're on too. So if you get a chance, um, just Google the um, U.S. Cadet for Nursing uh, Nurses. They are trying to receive recognition for these women um, in Congress to get recognized. Uh, right now, they, um, they really don't get any recognition and um, they really served our country and bridged the gap for us back then. So, and everybody, I appreciate everybody being on and listening. I hope it wasn't too boring. Please, <laughs> please, please um, go to Friends of Cadet Nurses. Um, Friends of Cadet Nurses is leading the, uh, the legislation um, rather than the educational site which you're going to. Okay. It's the Friends of Cadet Nurses. I've listed in the chat many times. And if you just Google Friends of Cadet Nurses, it'll pop up. And you'll see the legislation there. I have your mother's membership card, Neela. Awesome. And the date says that she's 18. Wow. Okay. So, so I, I think you might have, ha we, we can go over the birthday. Uh, email me and I'll send you that stuff. Super. Thank you. And uh, for the rest of you, if you could uh, get in touch with your senators to co-sponsor S-997. We're really close to getting this passed for honorary veteran status. Awesome. So we need your help. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, please stay tuned for another of our Historia DC online presentations on our Facebook page. Um, please take care of yourselves and your families and be well, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you.